Andy, we're just a few miles north of Laodicea here at one of the most spectacular places in Turkey, one of the natural wonders of the world uh, called Pamukkale. Uh, and above the travertines behind us is the ancient city of Hierapolis, also mentioned in the New Testament in Colossians chapter 4. So as we're sort of uh, discussing the seven churches and their relevance for the modern church today, uh, one interpretation is that the seven churches represent uh, periods of church history. Could you uh, talk about that? Yeah, I think this is a, uh, an interpretation that arose in the West. And it's, it's really an erroneous uh, approach to seven churches because uh, Jesus' message was to be relevant to the seven churches themselves. So they would never have understood it as historical periods. The other thing is I think the idea that the Laodicean period of history that we're in, some would say we're in now, is just an attempt to emphasize the end times, the falling away of the church which is also erroneous because globally, the church is growing globally, and it is not in a lukewarm state. In many parts of the world, it's growing very fast in China, in other places of Asia, Latin America, and, I, and in some, you know, so I just think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not really a helpful way of interpreting the seven churches. But I think you would agree that the whole issue of lukewarmness and the uh, materialism that we do have in the West you know, it does uh, characterize uh, the situation in, in uh, many churches, doesn't it? It can, uh, of course, it certainly can, but so can a lot of different things, you know. I think that it, it's relevant, I mean, the message of the, the, to the, the Church of Laodicea is relevant to us today, uh, but it is not, in my view, a historical period where that just defines the whole church as being in a state of falling away or, or lukewarmness. Yeah, one of the uh, issues in the seven letters that uh, always strikes me is that we have three of the seven that are experiencing persecution. Uh, in uh, Pergamum, we have a named martyr, uh, Antipas, probably a leader in the church that's been killed. And then both in Smyrna and uh, Philadelphia, we have a group called the Synagogue of Satan that's mentioned as those who are uh, bringing persecution against the church. and. I mean, we know Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of right. good cheer. I will overcome, there's our key That's word right. of victory again, I will overcome the world. And the idea again in the West that somehow we're miraculously going to be lifted away from persecution and not experience it, when uh, many around the world, even today, brothers and sisters are being persecuted, uh, jailed, uh, even dying for their faith. Right, and I think that, that we have to have a global perspective as it relates to the church, not just the Western church and Eastern church, and that we all should be identifying with one another. And of course, as, as you, you mentioned, there is persecution, there is suffering, and this is just normative part of our Christian lives and the extent, you know, advancement of the kingdom of God in our world. There's going to be conflict, there's going to be persecution, and yet, in, as you, the, the theme of the book of Revelation says, Jesus is the over, one that will overcome the world. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, we have to keep our, our, our focus on that fact. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, in the course of our uh, shooting around Ephesus that uh, this whole issue of orthopraxy, you know, is going to be critical uh, to the church. And that's my view as well. It's not so much a struggle over doctrine. It's just how are we going to live in this, in modernity, in this or postmodern uh, uh, world that we're in, uh, with all the is issues dealing with sexuality, etc., right. uh, and and as, and still being biblical. Right. Well, Jesus said we're to worship Him and God in spirit and truth, and we need both. We need truth. Uh, we need sound truth, uh, sound thinking. We're to love God with all of our minds. Mm -hmm but we're all to, to love God with all of our hearts. And so this is where the, the living out of our faith, and of course the theme of love that the Apostle John focuses in on is, I think, an emphasis of that. We're to be people of truth, but our truth is to be communicated through love and, uh, and, uh, and also in ways that really uh, love people of all kinds, of all locations, of all situations because they've been created in the image of God. 
Yeah, this issue of love that you're raising always strikes me in the letters because Ephesus, uh, as you've mentioned, is the church that's lost their first love. Uh, but they're very orthodox. They've got right doctrine. And you right. look at the church of Theatira, they're commended for their love, but their way they're living and following the, the false teaching of a Jezebel who's teaching accommodation. So they've gone to the other side. So I, I think I'm hearing you're saying we need to have a balance uh, between these two. Right. And I think, um, you know, so it's, it's interesting when you read the seven church le the letters, it says, let, the, let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, plural. So we know that every letter was being read by the other church. There were circular letters. So the messages that we read in each one, whether it's Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum, were relevant to that local church, but they were also relevant to the greater church. And I think it's the same way today. I'd like to get your thinking about that, is that all the messages of the seven yeah. churches are relevant to us today as well, and to the church today. Yeah, in many of the classes I teach, I have pastors, and I, I ask them the question, so if Jesus wrote a letter to your congregation, you know, what would he say? You know, what would you be commended for? Right. What would you be reproved for? You know, what would he be challenging you and your congregation to do uh, that you're falling short on? Right. You know, I pastored for a long time, as you know, and um, the one thing I've, I've thought about in reading the letters and I, when I talk to my, my groups is that, um, that it would be very interesting in a city if Jesus wrote a letter to every church about the pros and cons of what he, he liked about them and some of the things he's challenging them to repent on. And then he took that letter and let everyone, re all the other churches no. read about, read the letters that Jesus is writing to those churches. And I think that's what we, we see there. One other application that I do is applies to the church, churches, but also I think to individuals. The seven letters of the book of Revelation, instead of putting Ephesus there or Smyrna or Pergamum or Thyatira or Laodicea, put your name there, mm -hmm. you know, to, that, that, that this message is to you personally. So if you put your name there and really personalize the messages of the seven letters and really pray through them, that it it's really challenges us too mm -hmm. in our own thinking and our own lifestyle and the things that God would want us to to, to uh, uh, you know, give approval to or to, to encourage us about, but also areas of our lives that we need to repent from, turn from. And uh, I think when we apply the letters, all seven letters individually too, it's a really great instrument to grow in our faith. Yeah, and I think as we move further on in Revelation, we see that those who are the followers of the Lamb the, the victors are the ones who have the seal of the living God on their foreheads. And that group of believers in each of the seven churches expands. And you see that glorious vision that John has of people standing around the throne from every nation, people, tribe, and tongue. And I think this is the, here we are two millennia later, right. and we're with this global church that you're talking about, seeing the fulfillment of that vision that John uh, had. Yeah, and I would just conclude with this. Um, We've talked about the promises of every and uh, in, in all the seven letters. And of course, it says to those who overcome, and we've em emphasized that theme throughout our, our journeys. And one of the things that I've learned personally, and I'm sure you have as well, is that we can't do it alone. We can't, you know, there's a lot of battles. There's a lot of challenges in life, uh, not only the enemy, Satan himself and demonic powers, but other issues in the world that are forces that come against our faith. And we're called to be overcomers, but we're called to be overcomers together. Yeah. And uh, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you yeah, and you. uh, you're a close brother for many yeah. couple decades. And just the fact that we can encourage each other, build each other sure. out, help, help each other when we're in our weaknesses you know, because we want to cross the finish, finish the race as overcomers, and we'll do that together. Yeah, we certainly want to be seated at the wedding supper of the Lamb that uh, John also promises for the overcomers uh, in the future, That's in the right. new heaven and new earth.